If we pay attention to humanity, a lot of people aren't doing well, right? You notice, like, look around our families, hospitals are full, we spend billions of dollars on medications that are suppressing symptoms, and we're not getting to the root of why humanity isn't getting better, why we're not releasing stress automatically, why we're getting addicted to sugar and alcohol, worse, right? So we need to figure out what is it that's causing this suffering? What's, what's caused us to get off track as humanity? So what we need to do is figure out what that is and clean it up. We need to take responsibility for what it is that we carry. And that's what this work really is. It's about cleaning the slate. It's about resolving the past so that we can come from more of a possible future that's aligned with our heart instead of more of the same and plenty of it, right? Don't we kind of, almost like we continue patterns of our family, our ancestors. Anybody see that in yourself? Maybe you're like, oh my gosh, that's like my mom's stuff and I'm doing it, right? Because there's a kind of a blueprint or software that we're running that will continue if we don't clean up whatever it is that led to that software. And it, usually the software is not optimal, right? It's not supporting us in what we really want to be doing. It's more like survival, damage control, hand to mouth every month with money. Relationships are kind of a constant, you know, work, work, work to get our relationships to even be a little bit um, fulfilling. And that just doesn't seem right to me. I mean, were we put on this planet to suffer? Do you guys feel that way? It seems that way sometimes, doesn't it? But I don't know that that's our true nature, right? So what we do is when we resolve the past, so if something happened in the past and it's unresolved, it fragments a part of us. In other words, part of us is actually still in that experience trying to work it out. So if you figure out how many of those experiences we have just from our life, and then if you figure our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents, there's a whole line of unresolved grief, trauma, stress, I mean, look at the war, the Holocaust, the persecution, the, the things we did to the native peoples, right? Didn't our ancestors do some not so pleasant things to the indigenous First Nation peoples, right? So that's, has it ever been resolved? I don't feel that it was. Do you guys feel that it was? No. Did your parents ever sit you down and say, I'm so sorry that I drank and smacked you when you were eight? No. Um, at least my parents didn't, and God bless them. They, there's nothing wrong with them. No one taught them. So we're just continuing the same thing until we stop, until we arrest this negative cycle. And that's what this work is. It's about resolving the past so that we can create that future that we're talking about, the future of possibility. Because I feel who you are, why you're here is written in your heart. Your soul knows what it is you're here to do. And if it's not showing up, all it is is if something's from the past is affecting us. Something's blocking us. Something's creating kind of that imbalance. So when we create the balance, all things being equal, we can begin to manifest really quickly, really easily what it is that we want. Now, in our evolution, if we're only manifesting for ourselves, like me, 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 right? There comes a point where that loses its luster, that we realize like to, to receive for oneself alone eventually becomes a burden. And then we have kind of our wake-up experience where we realize, wait a minute, I'm here to be of service. I'm here to help others. And not in a codependent way, but because it's our nature, right? Aren't we created in the image and likeness of the Creator? Don't they tell us that? Well, what does the Creator do? It creates, it gives. It's like the sun. Does the sun look to get back from you? No, it's just shining. It just shines, and it shines on all of us equally, right? So I feel like that's our true nature, is to give, not to get anything back, but because it actually feels good. Now, if we're not at that place, that's fine. Maybe first we need to learn to give to ourselves. Maybe we, learn to, we need to learn to receive fully without the guilt, or without the unworthiness, or the, whatever is blocking that. And then out of that will arise the being of service. I mean, I feel, I, I kind of see it in other people too. Anybody ever see that movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? Remember, did you guys like that movie? I love that movie. Because he goes through the whole kind of archetype of humanity. Because he starts off real selfish and bitter, and he doesn't believe in any higher power and all that. And he's just kind of like all about himself. And then he kind of gets that dark night of the soul. He reaches that point where he realizes, wait a minute, i got to do something else. And then he tries to kill himself, right? He tries to like do everything to dest destruct his life, which we see that, right, in humanity. And then he realizes that doesn't do anything, right, because he has to come back and start from that same point again, and he has to work it out till he stops. And then he realizes, wait a minute, what's going to fill me? And then he realizes it's, it's that love, it's that service, it's that giving. Doesn't it feel good to give? Yeah. But most of us give to do what? Exactly. We give so that they'll appreciate us. We give so that they'll see we're enough. We give so they'll love us or, you know, and that's not giving. That's like putting a curse on them, 
right? Because then how do we know we're doing that? Because we get all upset. They don't appreciate me. No matter what I do, it's never enough. I'm like, well, then you're not really giving, you know? So we want to make sure we're really aligned and, and kind of congruent with that giving. And it's got to come from the heart and it's got to be organic. That's all it is. Because we didn't get that as children, most of us. And that's why we're a little bit off. Because we're still looking for it. We're looking for it in all the wrong places. Too many faces. What's that, a country song? So who doesn't feel good? Who's got something uh, maybe physical that doesn't feel good in your body? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> what do you have? Why don't you come over here and sit a little, you're way off in the corner. You want to sit right there, right there? Or I know everybody's like kind of spread out a little bit so we can kind of uh, community. Um, what do you have that you would like help with? A little tear, so it's not a complete tear. No, not complete. So, is it painful? Yeah. Yeah. When did that happen? Uh, about three years ago. Three years ago. Um, left knee. How long do you want it to take? <laughs> I want it to be real. Okay. Twenty seconds. Yeah. Is that too long? You want ten seconds? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Well, okay. Really What's the zero to ten of discomfort right now when you walk, stand, squat? Do a deep knee bend. It's very Hollywood, whatever I'm doing, but it's like the swelling doesn't, I can't get the swelling down. And but what's the zero to ten of pain or discomfort? I mean, I would say range of motion. It, um, it goes between a four and a six. Yeah. Okay, let's get it to a zero. Okay. Ten seconds. You ready? Check it out, walk around, see how that feels. Good. See, simple, 10 seconds. <laughs> and we'll keep working on other stuff too. Okay. It had to do with not feeling supported by men in her life growing up, like men not encouraging her to move forward. A lot of times, you know, it's nothing against the men, we didn't know any better, but we didn't necessarily support women in the ways they needed to be supported, you know go into all that and why that is and that's a common archetype but that's what the left knee represents usually unless there was a role reversal with our parents and that happens sometimes we see moms who've kind of taken on the male role if they're single mom or you know the male or the men are kind of weak or not em empowering themselves in a healthy way so the women kind of overcompensate Welcome to all of you for this first advance, as Jennifer said, for uh, January. You aren't broken. Now, <laughs> what does that mean? Maybe we think intellectually or we know intellectually, hey, I'm not broken. Right? But do some of us, maybe none of you, maybe people in this kind of self-help community, we could say, not to put us in that community, but in a way, do you see that there's some people with a... I don't want to say addiction because that's a strong word, but there's a propensity to work on themselves ad nauseum. In other words, they're always trying to fix themselves. So that to me means that there's something inside that's telling them that they're broken. Maybe. We'll look at this really deeply. And of course, with anything as we've been doing on the Monday calls is we want to be as honest as we can with ourselves, with where we are. Now, when one says or when we say you're not broken, of course, you know you're not broken. However, some of us kind of feel that way, right? Sometimes maybe more so in the past. Some people now, sure. But what we're looking at is something much bigger. We've talked about the um, quote from some place in the Bible. I'm sorry, I don't remember where. Uh, Look and you shall find. Remember that one? And to me, <laughs> I've commented on this a few times. It doesn't mean, you know, if we're looking for our keys, look and you'll find them. To me, it means if we look hard enough for something, we'll create the very thing we're looking for or we'll attract the frequency of the thing we're looking for. So there's something down deep in myself that I don't want to see. There's something down deep that someone doesn't want to feel. They may have a pattern where they continually try and fix it by fixing whatever, personality issues, certain flaws. You know. And this work is all about accepting where we are, which is a paradox. 
But we talk about that because being in the moment gives us momentum, right? So we want to see what is that deep peace possibly that we don't want to feel. I'm going to get into this in a moment. I had um, some, I consulted some professionals and uh, had a diagram drawn up, a uh, schematic. It's quite complicated. I don't like to complicate this work, but this, this diagram is, it's a little intense and you might, you know, it might, you might not even get it. Um, but I, I do want to share it because it really describes the mechanics or the schema of us with our problems. So I don't know, hopefully you can see this here. I had it uh, printed um, at a local firm that does architectural printing and all of that. So I wanted it to come out really clearly. So hopefully you can, you can see that. So does that, can you see that? I don't know if the focus is working. <laughs> so, but <laughs> I'm kind of being funny, but I'm really not. Okay, so if this is us with our problems, right? What do we see here? We see arrows going back and forth, right? Us to our problems. So if we think we'll just fix this and then we'll be done, what happens when another problem arises? Do you have or do you notice that there seems to be an endless flow of problems? And I don't mean problems as far as out there. I mean, just some part of us that thinks I got to fix myself. Now, you don't fix something that's not broken. So underneath all of that, there might be some belief that says, there's something wrong with us. Now, how many things do you see on this sheet? This is a trick question. Not the words, not the arrows. There's just two things on this sheet, right? Do you see them? Now, there's actually a third. What's the third thing on the sheet? Or actually, that, the, on the sheet is misleading. What's the third thing that you see right now? Besides you in the box of problems, right? What is the third thing? It's the sheet. Actually, you can still see through it because I used the Sharpie marker. It kind of goes right through the paper. So let's say the sheet is, is the sheet, right? So there's the sheet and there's our, pro our problems and then there's us. What is the sheet? The sheet is, we could say the creator, we could say it's consciousness, we could call it whatever we want. Let's backtrack a little bit here. We've talked about it a thousand times. You've heard it a million times maybe. You're created in the image and likeness of the creator. But the creator wasn't created. Wow. Get the simple physics of that. Someone recently emailed me, what do you mean when you say it's all physics? And I explained to them, I'm just saying keep it simple. It's cause and effect. Let's not complicate this. But take that in for a moment. If the creator wasn't created, because if something created the creator, that's who we would access, right? That would be the supreme, all-knowing, omniscient being, right? So if the creator wasn't created, and we were created in the likeness of the creator, what if we weren't created either? Now, we're not denying the personality. We're not denying the timeline, the story, the 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 separate beingness, the personality, or even the soul level of separateness, the sentient separateness, that's fine, we're not denying that. But in the big picture, in the equation of us with our problems, if we keep accessing either the small I or the problems, we're continuing that cycle, that circuit of chicken and the egg, which came first, right? We, we share in this work, they came simultaneously. It's not that one created the other. It's that they both arose. And it's almost like we needed both in order for each individually to exist, right? So for, in order for the, there to be light, there has to be darkness. In order for there to be darkness, there has to be light, right? We need the two. So in this separate experience of a person, a personality, or a sentient soul, or whatever you want to call it, there's infinite versions of that. We need to have, I don't want to say a flaw, because that would kind of feel a little intense maybe to some of you, I don't know. But there is something that comes with that territory of believing that we're separate or thinking, literally thinking that we're separate. So the point we're making is in that equation, if we identify with either of those two, we're just continuing that little cycle. But when we identify with the sheet of paper, we identify with 
this field within which problems, challenges, stuff, karma, whatever shows up, and this personality, right? This separate I, or seemingly separate I, whatever you want to call that, your personality, right? They're both arising within the field. So do you get what we're saying as far as if the creator wasn't created and you're created in the image of the creator, then, right? So you have access to that, the field, the screen, consciousness. Of course, that's half the work, right? That consistent invitation, we call it. But take that in for a moment because it allows us to snap out of that cycle that I'm broken and I have to fix myself. Because I used to, holy, you know, that's where a lot of this work that I do, other than the consciousness part, that half of waking up, the other half, the techniques that I use, most of that came out of my desperation to fix myself. Right? And here's the paradox. We're not saying that you don't work on yourself, right? Because we're here to improve our quality of life. We're here to experience all this, you know, the, the play. But if it's something that's keeping us from enjoying the play, if it's something that's a compulsion, it's sort of like an addiction. If someone can enjoy a glass of wine, maybe. I'm just saying someone, fictitious someone, let's say. But to have 10 glasses of wine or to have to keep having the glass of wine, NASA, there's a problem, right? So it's that kind of thing. So again, I, it's not like I don't do any work on myself. Yeah, I do work on what shows up. But it's not like I'm trying to fix myself. I accept who I am in the moment. And the paradox of accepting yourself doesn't mean we let ourselves go. Right? It doesn't mean I don't meditate or, you know, notice sensations, you know, the technical stuff happens. I'm like, great, my video's not working earlier. What can I do about that? Well, I'm going to do it. And then there's nothing I can do. I have to let it go. I still feel. So there's all kinds of energy that was coming up in the body when that was occurring. Because I'm like, hey, wait, there's all these people that are waiting for me to come on. They, they won't be able to have this interaction. You know, great. I still feel. And in the feeling, the work shows up. Do you get the difference? So we want to see where you are. Is there some part of us that feels like it's an endless cycle? Well, we'll just give you a little brief rundown of, of what this kind of what this work is. Um, anybody remember like the secret and the law of attraction and all that when it was really popular and everybody was into it and stuff like that? And uh, it didn't really work. You may notice that. I mean, it would it would work a little bit, but it wouldn't stick. You know, you'd kind of like go along and then uh, you kind of forget about it a week later after you became angry at your roommate or your neighbor because they didn't do what you expected them to do. So uh, really this work is about handling all the stuff that we carry that actually is affecting what shows up. So we can wish, wish, wish all we want for what we want to show up, but if what we're putting out below the surface, 90% of us is, is the opposite, it's not going to show up, is it? I mean, it's physics. What, what wins, the 90% or the 10%? So this work is about, is about accessing all that. We have a couple of stragglers. I just got in from windsurfing. Um, this is about accessing that. It's about seeing what it is we're really up to behind the scenes, seeing what it is that we really carry, and see what it is that we're really putting out, because that's what's showing up. You know, you can take leftovers, you know, and tell your kids that they're the most magical meal that you've ever made, but you saying it doesn't make it so. It's what you're actually giving them is what they're going to receive, no matter how much fluff or marketing you put around it. So, again, the positive thinking doesn't really work. And uh, so what is it that we carry? How do we figure out what we carry? How do we know what it is that we're really putting out? Well, look at your life. Look at what the reflection, all that you, sh you see in the external world is a reflection of what you carry. All the unresolved burden, all the karma, everything that you have within you that's really putting out into consciousness or God or creator, who believes in a higher power of some kind? Not sure what it is, maybe. Does anybody not believe? You don't have to believe in anything. I, I do feel there's an intelligent source. You know, I don't feel like it's a man with, with the, you know, sitting on the clouds and all that point fingers, but there is something that we can, we're speaking into all the time. And I don't mean just with words, it's what we're putting out. So if our legs hurting or if our marriage isn't working, or if, you know, we keep getting the same kind of boss like 10 times in a row, isn't that like kind of showing us that we're up to something? So I don't feel that it's, you know, a coincidence or is it a coincidence? Anybody believe in coincidence? No. 
if you look at the word coincidence, it's coincident. Two or more beings creating an incident. It's kind of fascinating. The language gives it away. It's like, wow, yeah, it is a coincidence. Because, no, it's not chance. That's not what it means. <clears throat> so, who's got something that doesn't feel good? Just one of you? Two of you? <laughs> what, do you what do you have that doesn't feel good? Um, a little bit of physical. Okay, a little bit of physical? Abdominal and back. Abdominal and back. Which, which, which part of your back? Lower back. Which side, left or right? Left. Left side. Um, do you want help with that? Okay, so we don't offer anything unless somebody wants it, right? It's free will. We don't put our will on others, do we? <laughs> There's obviously no parents here, right? Because that's all we do as parents, right? No. Uh, so left side, lower back. Uh, so it's just like a recipe. So if you, you add the eggs and the flour, gluten-free flour, and you put this, you know, whatever, and you, you preheat the oven, you're going to get what you're cooking. Maybe it's a, it's a bread or whatever it is. So we'll just mix up a little recipe and see what we can do for her back. Now, do I need to open the oven in order to put the cake in there? Or to put the batter or the dough or whatever it is? Yeah. So if her body language is this, and she says she wants help, but she's not, she's protecting herself, right? This is like the door, you know when you clean an oven, when you put it on clean and you can't open it because it's too hot, it locks itself, right? So we want to make sure that the person wants help. Now their 10% brain says, oh, I want help. And, and they believe it, and she does, she's not lying. But I also say I want to find my soulmate, I want to make a million dollars, I want to have that dream house on top of the mountain where I have, I just, all my bills are paid. That's my brain talking. What I really want is what I'm getting. What she really wants is the lower back to hurt the way it does. Now she doesn't consciously want that, nor does she deserve it. But all the stuff that's happened in her life up until now is creating, in my belief and in this teaching, some form of physics that's acting on her body. And her body's trying to get her attention. Her body's not stupid. Your body is so intelligent, evolved from primordial soup to now with the intelligence beyond our wildest imagination. I could tell you, I could describe to you the intelligence of single cell bacteria and what they do, the intelligence of that organism. And you'd be like, oh my, that's amazing, right? So we have within us a little bit more intelligence in theory, right? You don't know it from looking at the news, but, but we actually do <laughs> have that intelligence. So when we get out of the way, when we can clear what it is that we carry, our body will heal like that a lot of times. So I could just speak some words and say, please help you forgive your mother and all women for the times they weren't there for you, for the times they didn't support you, for the times you felt you were on your own, for the times you felt women didn't have your back, for all jealous women. Please help you forgive them no matter what. Help them forgive you. Help you forgive yourselves. Please and thank you. I didn't say God. I didn't say anything. I just spoke out into consciousness using a very specific recipe. How does that feel in your back? feels good. So the pain's gone from just that little bit. Go with me a bit because this is a great analogy and it kind of applies and we can see some stuff this way. So in the sense of an automobile, right, we know there are blind spots. I mean, so there's a, a usually a mirror on the left, mirror on the right in their car, and then a rear view mirror. If you're in the UK and Japan and places, then it might be over here. But those three mirrors give us what we think we know about what's behind us. So we can parallel that with our life. The normal lens of the mind sees what it sees and has access to, but it doesn't see everything and hence the word blind spot. When I was in New York City a long time ago, I remember the first time I saw one of these mirrors was a cab driver and they had this overlay on their rearview mirror, which was really long, but it was a series of convex mirrors. In other words, it broadened the perspective or view that they could see behind them. So they saw a lot more. In essence, it eliminated the blind spots, if you will. Now, the real way to eliminate a blind spot, I mean, backup mirrors, or uh, excuse me, backup cameras, you know, have become an obsession in, in many places in the world, and that's great. But the best way to eliminate a blind spot is what? If you're driving in your car, if you took driver's education, what would they tell you? Check your mirrors. And then you look, well, I'm gonna change lanes. I'm gonna turn to the left. I'm gonna actually look. So the direct experience, sound familiar, right? When we do that is a way of truly looking. It's not trusting the mind, which is the mirror, right? The mind's a reflection. And this is getting a little bit 
but just, you know, feel me out here. And so we want to have an ability to directly look. Now, if I don't know that there's something there to look for, then what am I doing? And that's what we're talking about with these other ways of looking at the patterns, looking at strange sensations, looking at what other people tell us. In other words, sometimes there's a spotter, an 18 wheeler, a big rig backing up. They'll have someone back there saying, you know, doing this number, right? Saying, <laughs> like, come on back, come on back. There are an extra set of eyes that's outside of the cab. So this could be our cab, right? The mind. So we could say we need a different lens or a broader lens. Those convex if you look at how they're shaped, they're like this, mirror shaped like that. They reflect out many different angles aside from just the straight reflection. So we want to approach our inner work. We want to approach what we're doing, what we're up to, what's occurring, what we don't want to see through a new lens, a new set of eyes. In other words, for me to see what's behind, I have to physically give up looking at the mirror. I have to let go of that in order to have that experience. Most people don't wanna let go of that, right? I know what's there, I know what happened when I was five, I understand what happened when I, in my first marriage. Okay, I get that, we're not arguing, that's showing up in that reflection from this perspective. But there's always more, there's always deeper, right? So we wanna, <laughs> right, you, you get, the, I love the analogy because I feel like it's just so perfect. I mean, you can't get much better. I mean, when someone has an accident, none of you, when someone has a car accident, what do they say most of the time? I don't know what happened or I didn't see it coming, right? I didn't know they were there. I didn't see them. That's what one of the two parties will, will say sometimes or a lot of times really. And that's because of their blind spot, right? They didn't see them. So it's very helpful to be able to see, because if we see, and when we see with new eyes, real eyes, right? We don't have to continue having accidents in our life, right? Having these collisions with bullies or injustice or our mate or whatever, right? We have a broader perspective. Make sense? So, we could say that all car accidents involve physics, right? Very clearly obvious, as we said, sometimes it involves uh, our behavior. We may have contributed to the, <laughs> none of you, one person may have contributed to the situation, the accident, and the other times it's the other person. Sometimes it's both. Doesn't really matter. The point is, is that we see that there's physics there. Accidents are not truly accidents. If we look and map it out, accident investigator will tell you this happened. This person was not going uh, the speed limit. This person was distracted. This person didn't check, do a physical check of that. This person ran the red light, right? There's things that happen. So same within our life, we can avoid a lot of this stuff. And when we start to have those different perspectives, remember the mirrors, we could say that the lens of the mind is limited, but the lens of the gut is not. In other words, our gut knows our blind spots, almost always. Now, it may serve us not to see, no matter how much attention we put on our gut or our sensation realm, because something may serve us. An example would possibly, out of infinite possibilities, that if we're supposed to meet someone, very important meeting, right? And I'm, I wanna to go to this concert, I wanna have this experience, I feel it in my gut, blah, 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 right? And it's not happening because I'm not supposed to be at the concert. I'm supposed to be over here where I have this divine meeting that's gonna change my entire life. So we might think we know what we need or want, and in reality, there's a higher intelligence that could be leading, guiding, and directing us over there. So do you get what we're talking about with the gut? We talk about the neurons in the brain, but there's also neurons throughout the body. Neurons are very much related to our higher intelligence and how they fire and the chemical process and all that. So there's that vagus nerve that we've talked about. Many of you know what that is. It's connecting really the mind and our inner knowing or our gut feeling. And as I said, almost always our gut knows. So when we listen to that, when we tune that, when we clear the stuff that doesn't belong in our gut, right? <laughs> that kind of stuff. Then, then the 
recept receptors are clear and we get a strong sense of, of what it feels like to feel a yes or a no, right? An excitement or a, mm. but if we carry a lot in our gut of other stuff, right? We talk about that, it creates a static and then we have a hard time trusting that impulse or that signal. So in relation to our blind spots in our life, a lot of times our gut knows. But what do most people do? Not you. Most people go into the mind and they navigate from there. And right, <laughs> this doesn't really work too well. We're, we're not, you know, putting the mind down, but it doesn't always have the information that we need. There's two journeys with this work. One is to help you wake up or see that you already are awake. And the other is to remove the burden and debris, the imprints, karma, whatever it is that's keeping us from living the life that's written in our heart, living the life that we came here to live. So if we're suffering, if we have physical stuff, uh, emotional, financial, we keep hitting blocks in our life, it's because there's some form of physics, physics acting on us, and it has to come from the past. Right? Because unless somebody's jumping on your foot right now, if you got pain in your foot, it's from something in the past. That sounds pretty obvious, right? But you'd be surprised. So we accumulate this stuff from our family, from our life, and from our ancestral lineage. So um, if you look back, you know, go back a few hundred years, look at the stuff that our ancestors have been through. It's pretty crazy. There's been war and, and Holocaust and famine and all kinds of stuff that's happened. That stuff was never cleared, cleaned up, or resolved, so it stores in us to some degree. So the theory behind this work is that when we can access this stuff that's causing us to not heal, causing us stress, um, hijacking our free will, the parts of the brain that allow us to make healthy choices, sometimes we don't make healthy choices, it's because of this burden that we carry. So it's, it's really um, about handling what it is that we carry and waking up. So those are the two things that we'll work on tonight. And when we say waking up, who you are is already awake. But the mind kind of comes in and tells us other things, right? So if we reference the mind to tell us who we are, we're gonna suffer, we're gonna misidentify with our story, our personality, and then there's gonna be more stress, more accumulation. But when we connect back to the truth of who we are, it doesn't suffer, it never suffered. In fact, there's never suffering in the present. And who you are is that fully awake consciousness connected to all that is, I am that I am, whatever you want to call it, that's here, it's present, and you don't have to do anything. It's already that. The mind doesn't, this is, the funny thing is the mind, it's the adversary, it comes in and tells us otherwise. So we're going to point you guys to that direct experience and also help you remove some of the stuff that causes you not to feel good day to day. Um, who in here does not feel good on some level? Maybe stress, maybe you're tired, maybe something hurts. Maybe there's frustration, maybe your job's not working out, maybe finances are struggle. Um, now when we have something that doesn't actually feel, like traditionally you don't consider financial something that hurts, but if you pay attention to the frustration around it, that doesn't feel good, right? So when we say pain, we don't necessarily mean, oh, you know, you have a bad elbow or backache or whatever. It can just be something inside that doesn't feel good. You know, that's what we kind of use the definition for what pain is. And chronic pain is anything more than three months. So technically, if we have chronic pain, you know, your body wants to heal. All things being equal, when you get out of the way, when you, you know, you're living your life in the flow of being, your body will take care of things. You know, scabs form, heals over, new skin forms and all that, the scab falls off. If you get hurt, there's injury, there's thromb thrombocytes, there's inflammation, uh, there's increased circulation, maybe the bones knit, whatever happens. All things being equal, if there's nothing else acting on it, your body will heal, right? Do we all agree with that? So if we're not healing, something else is going on. So this work, as I said, is about what we carry from the past. Now, the only other option to me is why we're suffering is that there's a creator, or God, whatever you want to call it, that's actually mean and doing something to us. Now, that to me is absurd. So I don't know, we all on board that that might probably not be, do you know? Like, it, whoever has a kid, you want to have a child, would you actually wish ill on your child? Now, some parents, you know, kids can be tough. Uh, and, and maybe for five seconds you might wish something on your child, but, but really overall, you want for your child. So the Creator, whatever that is, wants for us. And the precept of this work is that it's neutral, loving, supportive, and it's just there. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't put its free will on us. We have free will because we're created in the image and likeness of it. Right? We kind of believe that. Somewhere in creation when everything started, when there was original division, 
We were created in the image, so now we're a copy of the original. Now, we're not a complete copy, right? Because over time, instead of going back to the original to make a copy, whether it was Cain and Abel or whatever that symbolized, I don't know, go back to Mesopotamia or Lemuria or Atlantis, we, we made a copy from the copy. So in other words, we didn't, you have a CD, and oh, this is great, you know, but back in the days, those of you who were over 40, you remember cassette tapes and even 8-track and all that? So most of us are over 40, right? Most of us. If you're not, I apologize. Um, but, but we would go back, and instead of going to the original, we'd make a copy of the copy. So here we are, how many umpteen thousand millions, who knows how many years down the road, depending on who you believe, listening to like, almost like faint static, is there even, do we, can we even hear any of that original one song? And the thing is, it's still playing. And it's playing in the present, because we're created in the image and we still are, that never changed. But all the overlay, all the stuff that's happened that we, that's in us, carrying in our nervous system, that's affecting us from perceiving the original song and, and, and living out what it is that we came here to live out. Traditionally, this work, when I do it, is for us and our life. You've been married? That. And, and since growing up, you know, when we're little, our nervous system's not developed, so we don't have the ability to cognize truth. We kind of interpret things, and it's not always ideal. So a lot of times we make things mean things that they don't mean, i.e., dad was an alcoholic, he hit me, I must be a, you know, I must be unworthy, or it must be my fault, or something's wrong with me. Or my parents leave. If my parents leave, uh, parents leave, most people don't, both parents leave. If one parent leaves, then I think I'm not enough, right? Or I'm not lovable, or whatever it is that I told myself as a child. So that now becomes part of my, what, narrative. It becomes part of my belief system. It's part of that program that runs in the background that affects my perception, my decisions, uh, everything. That's only one piece. We're talking about thousands of pieces. So, in this work, we mostly address this life and your direct lineage from this body. Your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, going back thousands of generations. But one thing you'll hear me say is all life, lives, lifetimes, and incarnations. Because some people don't believe in past lives. I've seen a lot, and I feel like, yeah, there is past lives, but I don't feel they're past. I feel it's simultaneous, and I'm not going to get into that right now. If we have time later, I'll be glad to. Um, and again, that's my opinion, but it doesn't make it the truth. It's just how I feel it works. So we do work on that, um, and that's a good question. Um, because if you think about it, if a two-year-old comes into this, well, they didn't come in as a two-year-old, but as a two-year-old, they get maybe cancer. It happens. How is it possible that a two-year-old could have attracted enough burden in their life to, create can to have cancer, if, it's, if that's how it works? So we can go say, well, it's from the lineage. The lineage stuff that maybe it's creating the body to have the mutation, the cells, and all that, what creates cancer. <clears throat> But what caused that soul to incarnate into that lineage? And that's where your question would maybe come in. So maybe the stuff that that soul is working out caused it to come in. And, or do we, do we reincarnate within the same lineages? You know, that's another question. I think it's both. But that's a great question. It's probably a little bigger than what we are starting with right now. So, but it's good. It's a good question. And uh, I can talk really fast because there's data coming through about 50 times faster than what I'm speaking. So I'm kind of just deciding what needs to come through and I just, the rest of it just kind of falls off like water off a duck. So uh, if I spoke as fast as stuff was coming through, you wouldn't be able to understand what I'm saying and it would be really brutal and you guys would be like, what? And you'd, you, you know, you'd all get really tired. No, you'd get really tired because your nervous system can only absorb so much. <clears throat> Mine too. So good question. So what we need to do is start to, un to, st start to unravel or lift this stuff that we carry. Right, because that's, that's what we're here to do. You guys didn't come here to hear me talk, right? Or maybe a little bit, but let's do some actual work. So who's got something that doesn't feel good? You, actually, most everybody has something in some form. Financial, it's not a pain, right? But there's frustration or stress around it, right? We think about a bill coming in, right? We think about looking at our bank account. Don't we feel a little something in our body that doesn't feel so optimal? That's where you start. So you'd notice that. So everybody notice what they feel inside. If you're, if you're crossed up, I'm not going to tell you to uncross, but just notice if you have a TV antenna and it's a little bit like the rap, remember the old school rabbit ears? You wouldn't cross them up, would you? So we just kind of want to be a little open if we can. Uh, so I'm just going to do one thing. It'll take about 15 seconds to just see what you feel in your bodies. I'm just going to do one thing and then I'll tell you what I'm peacemaking for and then you notice what you feel. Okay? Does that sound good? Okay, here we go.
Okay, anybody, what do you feel? What are you noticing, if anything, in your bodies? You're good. Well, it's not me but doing it, but thank you. Uh, what, are you what are you noticing? Energy is flowing. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Gut to heart. Yeah, things will move. When we do this work, I've seen like 20 years of arthritis in a shoulder, go to the other shoulder. And people are all freaked out, you know. I'm like, it's okay, just, just witness it. You don't have to judge or understand this stuff. Remember, the, remember what got us into trouble? The mind. So the mind can't get you out of trouble. It doesn't have access. So I can tell you right now, if your mind's running this perception of what's happening, we just started, so you're good. Uh, if your mind's telling you what's true, what's not true, I would just say let that go and trust what you feel inside. Trust your heart because it knows the truth, right? So when you meet somebody, maybe somebody, maybe they hate, all your friends want you to go out with this person and you're like, you get a little cringy, listen to that. Don't listen to, well, he's got a great job, he's got money, he's got a nice car, he goes to yoga. Do you know what I mean? That's the mind trying to figure, to rationalize that this is the person. No, if you get a bad feeling, trust that. That's what this is about. So I want you guys to get in that flow of learning to trust that. Most of you, some of you already do. You know, you do some, but sometimes we forget. That's okay. Uh, anybody else want to share what they felt from that? And then I'll tell you what we did. Yes, sir. Clearer. For clearer. Okay, good. Anybody else want to just share what they felt from that? Yes. Lighter. Feel lighter. Okay, good. Anybody else? Nobody else? Some people are reserved. They don't like to share. It's okay. Um, they're afraid I'll call them out or do something mean. Um, <laughs> So that was just peacemaking for you and your father. Just all the hurts and wrongs with your father. Times he abandoned you, times he wasn't there for you, times he didn't love you, nurture you, support you in the ways you needed. We just made peace for just you and your father. That's just one tiny little piece of what you carry. Now we'll do mom. Okay, here we go. Okay, what are we feeling in our body? This is, we're not even doing specific burden. Sometimes we start with the burden, not the relationship, but tonight I felt to start with the relationship because we're gonna start with actual burden. Uh, not, we're not gonna start with it. We're gonna go to actual burden and then start with that in, that in a minute, but we're just doing basic relationships so you can see. You know, whoever has a lot of stuff with dad is gonna feel a lot from the dad stuff. Whoever has a lot of stuff with their mom, right? This isn't even for your lineage and it's not for other lifetimes. 